In today's episode, I talk with Alana Ball, the founder of Women in Safety. Hi, and welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. I'm Tom Bourne, your host, and today with me, with me is uh, Alana Ball. Alana, good morning. Hello. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Alana, you've had a very busy two years. Can you tell us what you're currently up to? I can. Two years. Um, I had twins. Uh, that was an exciting part of those two years, uh, but also fully launched Women in Safety as a proper service offering. I guess it's been a little bit of a side hustle the last few years, but decided to fully go all in and really support um, women working in health and safety. So we've launched the paid membership. We've been doing month to month webinars, quarterly masterclasses. We launched the summit. Uh, and what I just recently launched was the Women in Safety Awards, which is our first. So it's been a big two years, Tom. It's been a yeah. very big two years. Excellent. And how's it going? How is Women in Safety tracking? Yeah, look, um, it's been interesting. I guess it's one of those, uh, I had to become really clear on what it was we did and why I was doing it, because it took a lot of effort and energy to go from side hustle to what does it mean as a business? And I guess for me, one of the really clear kind of standout messages that's come in that last little while is going, do you know what? I truly feel that if women in safety is successful in what we deliver in that concept of empowering, transforming and inspiring the profession, that the women working in health and safety can truly make changes to families like yours and mine to go home safe. And getting really clear on that has just driven every conversation, every webinar I do. Uh, I think knowing that if I get it right and these women feel empowered, then they make some really, really cool changes in their workplace. What better reason to keep going and to keep putting that effort in? Yeah, no, that's excellent. I've I've attended a couple of meetings. Obviously, I'm not female, but uh, fully supportive because I believe sort of um, equity in the workplace, particularly in the safety field, um, leads to better results. It leads to sort of better understandings and 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 better overall outcomes for safety as well. Yeah. The cup, the yeah. couple of meetings I've got to got to tell you, Alana, absolutely professional. And so I was kind of blown away by the level of, I, I, can't, I can say it, knowledge and intelligence of the people who actually attended. So um, congratulations on that. And they were, they were the fun. They were fun. Um, yep. I know from one of the ones I attended in Brisbane, I took ideas straight back to my employer at the time. And that led to a fundamental change in sort of the way we actually delivered part of the business, which was Absolutely awesome outcome. So I can't speak highly enough why businesses should support you in, in your endeavours in this part. But moreover, I think there's there's a there's a greater challenge it should be faced in workplaces where safety is paramount. Now I'm talking about things like the high risk industries. Mm. Over, over here in WA, very big on mining. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, the Minerals Council recently introduced a, a response to sexual harassment that is occurring mm. in the workplace. Um, absolutely appalling, absolutely appalling mm. some of the things that have come out. Um, do you think that do you think that we can actually change that culture away, move away from uh, Let's be honest, it's sexual harassment. It's illegal behaviour that occurs in the workplace. Yeah, and look, it still very much is happening. And, you know, part of women in safety is that I've had my own experience of it as in terms of not so much the direct what you would call sexual harassment, but I've had the truck drivers being like, come and do you want to come and check out me sleeper cab, love? Um, and it's those kind of conversations that I guess stick with you throughout your career going, if I was a guy would that conversation have occurred? Uh, do I think that we can change it? Yes. But what it takes is 
women to be empowered, uh, which is something that certainly sits in our wheelhouse of uh, attempting to help them with, you know, that inner voice that they stand up for that and they are confident to speak about these things, that it's not just shunned, you know, that I was, you know, dare I say the Me Too movement, I don't want to get into that, but it's that if we feel confident to speak and we know that it's happening, uh, but until we feel empowered to speak, conversely to that, you know, Tom, it's incredible men like yourself not only having this podcast to share genuine conversations but men that support and actively support women to drive equity and equality in organisations. Because albeit I started Women in Safety and the name has women in it, I am a huge advocate of it will take all of us, um, regardless of gender, um, to overcome a lot of this. And it's going to take conversations and it's going to take brave conversations to start making change that if we don't keep talking about it and we don't make it aware and we're not actually I guess being confronted with it and talking about it openly and honestly where does change lie yeah I I, I don't even think it's it, it's in the realms of um, sidelined to a HR issue at this stage either because when you come down to things like uh, the PCBU's duty to provide a safe workplace. Mm. That's that's fundamental. That is that's that is the fundamental uh, duty of, of all employers. And a safe workplace means free from sexual harassment, free from bullying mm. and harassment, all of these things, which yeah. usually we bundle off into psychosocial and then might say it's too hard, it's a HR issue. It's actually a health mm. and safety issue. It's not necessarily just a human resources issue that we try and hide or push under the carpet and it's one person. But I think there's there's got to be a little bit of shift, I think, in the as, as an ex-HR. I think there's got to be a bit of shift in expectation from the HR professional side as well, that we've got to work collaboratively. Mm-hmm. I just finished doing a um, ISO 45003, the psychosocial um, standard, uh, and we had all of these kind of in one, um, for it was a large government department, and on one side you had uh, HR dealing with all the workload, the stress, the bullying, you know, leaders being unfair, and then you had safety that didn't even know that this stuff was existing And so we talk about from a risk management perspective, these guys didn't even know whether the risk was existent. They thought it did, but they didn't have the data to back that up. So I think there's going to be a little bit of we need to see more collaboration between HR and safety of what it doesn't have to sit in a wheelhouse. It is a systemic risk within the business, as is a reputational risk, as is a financial risk. It's not in a wheelhouse. It yeah. is a business risk. Yeah, oh, yeah, that, that's good. Um, there's a couple of things with it that was raised by the Minerals Council. One of the things which is re- I found really interesting was they're talking about making a register of people who have been, let's say, offending sexually on work sites. So that because it seems to be some sort of uh, process that seems to have been followed where offenders are dealt with internally and then moved on to another site where it's not known about their, their history or what they've done. And in some cases, they've actually been promoted out of the position <laughs> and put in another in another site where it's not known. And lo and behold, the behaviour repeats and repeats. Mm. Um, it's it's really sad that we have to come to that, which is almost like no offense. It's like a sexual offender register. Yeah, but, but employers. I, well, I was going to say, well, add to the list um, bullies in general. Mm. You know, I know for a fact that someone I've worked with in the past that very much was a bully has gone on to secure um, a lead another leadership position, and I hope beyond all hope. Um, you know, I, I wanted to send them off with the warning sign that says, be aware of these really narcissistic behaviours. Uh, but that's so, 
albeit no, sexual harassment should never be allowed on site, where does that register end? Because I think the the damage that's done to an individual uh, psychologically from a bully versus sexual harassment, like at, at what point do we stop the register? Yeah. Um, yeah. To me, to me, it's it's a matter of if we're making a if companies are making an internal register, perhaps they should think about I don't know referring it to the police because it's mm. an offence. Yeah, it's it an offence. Yeah. Um, and although we might not like to send our people off for police to be charged, where do you stop tolerating illegal behaviour mm. on site? Um, mm. And, and yep. bullying, bullying and harassment for me, my personal experience is. If it's not dealt with and nipped out at the bud, the person just moves from one target to the next target to the oh. next target and, and so on. Yep. They just don't That's what I said. I want to send them. I want to send them off with a little warning sign, a little thing above their head. But you know, you, you kind of it begs the question: What good is a CV and a reference check when these people are then promoted in the next role? Well, who did their references? Like, what did they say about them? Let's, because. Mm. Let's just yeah. let's just give them a glowing reference so they go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, someone else's perhaps problem. Perhaps that's it. Yeah, yeah. Oh dear. All right. Um, that's an interesting topic. We could talk about that forever. I feel like. Mm. All right. Um, women in safety. Uh, yep. Can we look forward to perhaps either a West Australian chapter occurring or perhaps uh, a bigger presence in WA in the future? Look, Tom, I think um, it's very much the goal. Uh, we, we've we been working pretty hard, as you know, I'm, I'm Brisbane-based, and I think primarily if we go all the way back to why or when I founded it, I thought there would be three of us catching up for a wine every quarter to just share ideas. I didn't think that we would have had the growth that we had or that the, there was the need that there is. Uh, so it's been certainly humbling and exciting to see just how much interest there is in this, certainly since launching it, I guess, full time um, from my point of view, uh, we are definitely looking at those growth opportunities. So we've had a few uh, members come on and organisations certainly from a, a corporate perspective come on board. Only even in the last two months, we've had a few. Uh, we are currently in uh, conversations with Southeast Asia because there's a number of women working in health and safety in, you know, Singapore, Malaysia. So it's not to say that we will not. It's just a case of uh, we've done almost no advertising, kind of targeting anyone. Uh, it is a case of we just – I'm – I, I, it is just me. I don't mm. have a team. So uh, finding that time and that those connections to really go, hey, you know, we're here to support those in WA, in South Australia, Northern Territory, Tasmania, uh, wherever you are and you need that support. As I just said, we just launched the Women in Safety Awards. Funnily enough, we just had someone nominated from the UK. Uh, so the, it, it's astounding where it goes, but um yeah, it's certainly on, on the radar to uh, support those in WA and all around Australia because my big thing is that, as as I said, the more we can empower them to bring their best self to work, there's some really great outcomes that happen. And, you know, we talk about the the safety stats that are happening just within Australia. Uh, it's not good enough. You know, mm. fatalities in the workplace, what we're seeing, what we're seeing from, you know, data year on year is we, we, we're not really getting anywhere. We're not improving. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of a bit of my mini personal goal to be like, how do we start shifting that through utilising the membership in Women in Safety to make some really positive change in that? Yeah. Um, just want to take one step back about perhaps changing the culture in workplaces, uh, particularly on how women in industry are actually treated mm. do you think do you think it's a leadership that strong strong leadership at the top of organizations is needed to stamp out some of, let's be honest some of the poor behavior that happens or do you think like with bhp their push is to have an equitable workplace of 50 percent female representation, 50% mm. male representation, 
so that attitudes change. Um, yeah, look, I'm I'm not a huge I, despite uh, people probably thinking that I would have a different opinion, I'm not for the the um, you know you must have a fifty percent workforce because mm-hmm. I think that just drives bums on seats mm-hmm. versus a true change. Mm-hmm. I think if we have leaders, certainly driving the conversation. I think if we have people, one of the issues I think we've got is um, the job task, the language that we use, the cultures that are existing on site. Now, you only have to speak in the Women in Safety membership for a day to find out there is still places that have, and I will never, ever forget this conversation of a female on a mine site owned by a very well-known female Mm -hmm. um, that there was one toilet on site that had a sanitary bin in it and that if you were working on the other side of site and you went to that particular toilet, everyone on site went, you must be on your period. What in the hell is that for any sort of um, progression of women in the workforce if a bodily function that we have no control over is ridiculed based on where toilets are placed. Like what world are we living in? Um, So it's still very much happening. I think it definitely takes leadership. I don't think it is driven from a numbers perspective. Mm. I don't think a 50% on site is going to change a thing uh, other than you now have 50% on site and that 50% is still going to be marginalised. based on their gender um mm. you you apply that to uh indigenous the same thing would happen you know we, we put these targets certainly it's it's a great target to aspire to but let's actually talk about what the what would we see differently what would we feel differently what would our, what would we hear let's put that personal level on that culture piece if we had equity equality on site if Mm. inclusivity was on site not okay well we got 50 percent women hang on a minute the same stuff's still happening yeah yeah no that's good that's good because i knew from my perspective i've always thought the best person for the role regardless of age color gender religion regardless i think forced quotas in the short term actually do more harm than they do um, then good because then we have a group of people suggesting that other people only got the job because of a characteristic um, that yeah. they may or may or not have. In the long term, I think it can lead to change, but uh, in the short term, I think it's actually a negative um, mm. situation. And I think we've got to look at systemically why are people, why are particular genders going into those roles? Um, are we making it harder at the recruitment end are we making it harder at the education and you see all the work that's being done for women in STEM at the moment to get them into kind of more of those engineering type uh, roles so I think we've got a way to go at kind of that that education level before we start putting quotas in place yeah yeah I I I notice that um, some of the trucking companies in uh, West Australia and South Australia are now trialing uh, more family flexible hours for for trucking to try and encourage women to take up some of the roles simply because mm. th- they realise that their work practices are basically alienating fifty percent of the Australian population from moving into that field. That's got to mm. be a positive. Um, but those family friendly policies probably should have been there also for males right from the get go. I mean, mm, they don't want to miss out on seeing their family. Well, that's exactly right. That's exactly yep. right. Um, I'll ask your opinion about something which probably I shouldn't because it's a bit controversial. What's your opinion on FIFO? Look, I think um, I and look, we we get asked from a women in safety perspective to assist with recruitment at times. And often it's like, oh, can you throw this out? And again, it usually is a case of um, we're not allowed to say that we want a woman in this role, but we want a woman in this role, Mm -hmm. whether at a quota or what. Uh, And then they tell me the the type of role and it'll be either FIFO or drive in, drive out. And um, 
they tell me that, you know, it's X amount of weeks on and X amount of days off, whatever it might be. And I kind of just turn around and go, well, I can tell you now uh, that majority of my membership will turn their nose up at it because we are working parents Mm. uh, or if not, uh, what does that actually inspire us to do? So from the female perspective, I think um, it's hard for, like I certainly know hand on heart, there's not a chance once upon a time, single, I might have done FIFO. Um, great opportunity to get some money in the bank. I have seen, you know, in extended family, what it does to FIFO does for families. Mm. Um, you know, divorce, certainly attempted suicides and all the rest. Um, I think I can see the, the why it happens. Mm. Um And I think we are a resource-rich nation, but my concern is we're not doing enough to support those workers. And, again, you hear the stories of the guy that gets on the flight and the wife is there going, don't go, don't go, don't go, but then the husband comes home and it's like, oh, now you're ruining our routine. Like we were Mm. already in routine and we don't want you home because we're, we're stuck in our routine now. And, yeah, so there's... I can see the reasoning behind doing it from a business standpoint, from the financial operational standpoint, I can see, make it see perfect sense from a psychological uh, look at the rate of mental health in Australia, let alone just in FIFO. We're we're not doing enough to support them. Uh, We're not doing enough to make it equitable for those people doing it. Uh, And I think as a result, we're seeing this, the statistics reflect that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree, hundred percent. I can I, I I can see the need for it, but mm. it's I've never seen it work out great for families in a long term situation. Um, no, it's, it's it's not family friendly. But, let's but, be honest, but look, let's be honest. Even for young single females or single men, I don't think it's great. Uh, no. It it promotes a money. Um, go and blow it, go and buy all the fast things. That pop. And it's we talk about that golden handcuff perspective and that it becomes the addiction. They can't leave it, but then they find someone, they have a family. Uh, yeah, it, it does a lot of damage, I think. Uh, yeah. I like the golden handcuff because that's the kind of thing I, I, I tell people all the time. I said, let's be honest. You love the money, you'll become addicted to the money, and then you'll say, I can't leave it because I won't get a job. And the truth is, most people will earn, will live on whatever they earn. Mm. But yep. um, whether they're happy or not, that's a different matter. And that's, I always, I always recommend to anyone have your out strategy with it. So know that you're going for a specific period of time or a specific, you know, it might be a target that you want to get a house deposit. Have that target in mind. Uh, and don't be wed to walking away after that time. Mm. Uh, revisit it for another goal, uh, but it shouldn't be your lifelong goal of working away from your loved ones for weeks at a time. I just don't think that's feasible. Yeah. All right. On to some generic questions. Ah, as a safety professional, harmonisation, do you think that's worked across Australia? Uh, to some extent, yes. I think it's kind of been able to create a level playing field almost, despite a couple of states not doing it. I think it's given us leverage to be like, okay, we're all talking the same language uh, from from core basics. And you think with a transient workforce, with technology, working from home, all the rest that we've seen in the last couple of years – I think that harmonised language for us to all be working on the same thing. But let's look at what's happening now where everyone's bringing out their own bits and pieces with mm. like industrial manslaughter. It's not in every state. So we were harmonised, but I think every state is now going further and further away from what that harmonisation is. So, that's, yeah, that's exactly yeah. my thoughts. I've, I, I was like, yeah, we, we were almost there and now we seem to be pulling apart at the seams yeah, the penalties aren't the same. The regulations aren't the same. Here in WA, we adopted the lovely uh, model health and safety act, but then we've gone and, for some reason, got three sets of regulations, not just one like yeah. everyone else. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like I think it it 
served its purpose for a little while in into getting some baseline stuff done, but now it's so obvious that every state is just like, well, yeah. and I think it's this, you know, we want to be the leaders in X, so yeah. we want to like, yeah, it, it's it is what it is. But no, I don't think it's working now, uh, and we I think we continue to see states going and doing their own business. Just following on that, it's one of those things that's that's um, peeved me for a little while is every state and territory has their own regulator of work, health and safety mm. legislation. Wouldn't it be better if we just had one regulator, one regulator across Australia so that everyone dealt with the same regulator and the same... I think it, it would be good, but I think the way that you know, from a, um, and by no means am I political, but I think how we're set up as a nation and how we make laws makes that. uh, Unlikely. It's, it's unlikely. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Because you've, you've, the way that, you know, uh, the legislation is formed and created and passed and all the rest. I think it's just too unlikely. Uh, It would be nice, but I think then you're talking that there would be, uh, not the Queensland police, that the mm. federal police would be the guys that you see on the ground as well as, you know, the federal police doing their job. So I think across all of it, you would have to say that the health and safety regulator, the the beat, beat cop type day-to-day police would have to be an Australian level, like all of that mm. regulatory type behaviour uh, would come out of states and we'd be a national versus a state based approach I, I i would think so it's very improbable but i look at new zealand and i go they they're coping just fine they, yeah they're obviously much smaller much smaller infrastructure etc yeah. etc et <laughs> but they seem to manage it and um, i'm not saying their health and safety regulators do a great job um but it's a system that works and I go, oh, mm. maybe all right um getting towards our time limit. So I'll just ask you a couple of little things. Any safety slogans that you're not a fan of? Because there are a million Um, ones out there. No, not a safety slogan. I'm really tired of seeing the BS that happens online between the, you know, you see someone say that there's zero harm and that Mm -hmm. the the trolls go, yeah, can't be zero harm your safety differently. You can't be your safety too, your safety, whatever. I am sick of people having to aspire to a particular model when every organization is such at such a different cultural point of their journey Mm -hmm. that if it's working for them, I don't care what it is. You can call it safety BS for all I care. Um, as long as it's working for that particular organisation to overcome the cultural journey that they're on now, so be it. Why are we as safety professionals Judging. slamming each other for what name has been given to a particular model to achieve a better culture? Shouldn't we just be celebrating the fact that they're on a cultural journey of change? Yeah. Like we've lost scope of that and that's it's not a safety slogan but it's just like come on. Does it really matter what name we put on it? They're on a cultural journey and we should goddamn celebrate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Preaching to convert it. All right. (laughs) Uh, Very briefly, industrial manslaughter, are you a fan or not? I am. I think it, we, from a, from the family's perspective, Mm -hmm. I think there needed to be more done in it uh, because I think, Joe Jane, Josh Bloggs down the road in a workplace could kill someone almost. Here's cash, thank you, walk away, versus uh, someone who killed someone out on the street. So I think there's a place for it. I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out over the next little while. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, yeah, how I know it's been obviously – tested in a court of law but I think we'll need to see a few more before we see the true implications of it and and how it's being utilized and what that um burden of proof I guess that sits behind it will be excellent excellent all right 
little question here. Um, what's what's on your desk that would what's a personal item on your desk that means something to you and why? Um I would say not on my desk, but on my desktop. So on my actual computer screens. Uh I'm all for that vision boarding uh and knowing what you want to achieve in life and whatnot. And so I've got I've just minimized my screen. And I've got my vision board across all of my screens and it's got all the things that mean something to me that I'm aspiring to do so that every day when I sit down and love what I do, I'm reminded of where I'm going and what I'm working towards by having my vision board on my screen. Excellent. Excellent. All right, Alana, before we go, how can people contact you? How can people get involved in women in safety? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um so womeninsafety.net is our website at Women in Safety across Facebook and Instagram. We have a community level membership, which costs nothing, but our monthly membership is under $15 a month. So you're more than welcome to come and try it. If it's not for you, we have our member mingles where, where our members jump on and have some really genuine conversations about the successes, the struggles that I'm trying to overcome this, I've got a really challenging workforce, whatever it might be. It's a really inspiring time to be a part of the membership. I think we're starting to really kick some amazing goals and I encourage anyone who is looking for that safe space to have conversation uh, to come and share with us because it's been really powerful the last few months and I think it's only going to continue to grow. Excellent. Thanks for your time, Alana, and I'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Tom. Keep up the good work.